Imagine, a podcast series by Imagine Theatre. Hello again. How are you? I can't believe it's June already. The year is flying by. Welcome to episode 29 of this podcast series from one of the UK's biggest producers of pantomime and children's theatre. For more information, go to their website at www.imaginetheatre.co.uk. I'm Martin Ballard and before we begin, a quick reminder that if you've missed any of the previous episodes with creatives, actors and behind-the-scenes tours of Imagine Theatre, you can catch up with each and every one of them because they are all still available. And don't forget to subscribe to the series so that you don't miss out on any future episodes. Now, in episode 28, we caught up with the associate producer and head of celebrity casting at Imagine, Laura Taylor. This time, we're going to take a more detailed look behind the scenes in Imagine Theatre's wardrobe department. With more shows and venues than ever before, this Christmas is going to be particularly challenging. Thousands of costumes to clean and allocate, hundreds of fittings to be scheduled, and the inevitable alterations and maintenance to do as well. Well, this is a very, very busy period for acting head of wardrobe, Aaron Gibson. How are you, Aaron? I'm very good, thank you. It's a sunny day. I'm feeling good. I'm in my shorts. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit optimistic, actually, because the air conditioning's pretty powerful in here, isn't it? Yeah, it is, but I can guarantee if we've got the dryers on in wardrobe, it's oh, going to get course. really hot. Of so. course, yeah. I mean, the dryers are banked up behind you in there as well, the washing machines and so on. Let's talk about you to start with and and your background. How did you come to, A, get interested in wardrobe and B, come to Imagine? Okay, so I'm an actor by trade, but as I was going through my career, I kind of decided I wanted to develop a new skill. I wanted something else that I could potentially fall back on if things didn't go my way. Um, And so uh, just this one day, a sewing machine happened to land on my table (laughs) at home. And I thought, you know what, I'll give that a go, see what happens. So I'm I'm very much self-taught. I've taken some tutorials. um, And then over the years, I've I've built up a skill set, which I can now use. Um, And then I was actually on a panto in Barnstable. I was playing the genie and the emperor there. And um, one of the girls who was with me mentioned that wardrobe were looking for you know uh, a set of extra hands just to do some work so I thought well actually I, I would love to do that you know it's just some freelance bits and bobs um, and so they called me in and the rest is kind of history now I've, I've been here probably over five years on and off in various different capacities within wardrobe. 99% of all actors have another job of, of one sort or another um, and you're able in that sort of situation to still go for auditions you know get get work where you can and so on but obviously now you're covering somebody on maternity leave so presumably you've had to put acting to the side for a time have you yeah very much so the magnitude of the role requires a full-time concentration so it's just one of those situations where i've had to say do you know what this year the acting side is is not for me. I'm just going to concentrate on this. And to be honest, I'm really enjoying it. So you've done obviously lots of different things, but why do you love Panto so much? I've been doing it for years. It's part of both mine and my sister's blood, really. I watched my sister do Panto for the first time. Gosh, it must be 90, 99, I think it mm-hmm. was. So a, a little while ago. And she was one of the the tots at the Belgrade Theatre. And I was doing other shows at the Leicester Haymarket at the time. So it was just one of those things that I, I used to come and watch my sister. And I thought, you know, what? this it's this incredible magical world full of glitter and costumes. And, and it was just, it was good fun. So I, I wanted to be a part of that somehow. Um, and it was only on graduating from drama school that, I got my first opportunity to be in a panto. So I'm interested now because obviously anybody who listens to this on a regular basis or has seen the pantos with me in will know I'm from Leicester. So the Haymarket obviously uh, did reopen for a little while but it's closed again now. So what sort of stuff were you doing there? I auditioned many, many years ago when I was 10 years old for a production of Oliver. I, I went in initially to audition for Fagin's Gang and there was about 400 kids there on the day. And I remember it very clearly because it was actually the day of the eclipse and we stopped the the audition halfway through to go out and watch and it was amazing. Mm. But we had to get up on stage in front of Paul Kerrison, who was a great director, and we had to sing Food, Glorious Food, one by one. Uh, And after that, I I went back out into the auditorium to go and meet my dad, thought that would be it for me for the day. And a lady came out and said, "Um, would Aaron like to come in and audition for Oliver? My dad and I looked at each other and he said, can you sing? And I just shrugged. I was like, I don't know, maybe. And so six or seven auditions later, 
I got the part of Oliver. Wow. And so for the next three <laughs> seasons, I was at the Lesser Haymarket doing their, their Christmas shows. Do you, do you know what the, the amazing thing is? I actually saw you in that show then, probably. I mean, there would have been maybe two or three Olivers, but, uh, you know, I may have seen you in that show. Yeah, it's more than that. My, likely. you've grown. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I've now got a, a hairy face and uh, it's, all, it's all very different. And the way I sing now is very different, but um, yes. it, it's fond memories. It's interesting, though, isn't it? Because we talked on this podcast a lot about the influence of Panto, um, you know, getting children into the theatre for the first time to see a show or even to perform in a show. But musical theatre can do that as well. Other other forms of theatre can do that as well. But that really opened up the, the door for you, didn't it? The thing is, it's just so accessible, isn't it? It seems to be on a level playing field for both kids and adults, but especially when they're seeing it for the first time, it's such a spectacle. There's so much to take in. It's a great experience for them, and it's kind of that gateway into theatre, and, and, and from that you learn different art forms from it, and you go, actually, well, there's so much more. So it's really uh, a key in the door for most kids. I'm going to go home and look at the programme. I've got the programme somewhere. I'm going to look at that, see if I can find you, see what <laughs> you look like at that age. OK, so this is a, a tricky year. Obviously, you've got more shows than ever before for Imagine this coming Christmas. And you've come in as maternity cover. And we spoke briefly on a podcast uh, a few months ago about the Oracle, Dawn, who you know has literally built up the whole department and is now on maternity leave. So it's a big ask to come in and learn all that, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, I feel very fortunate that I've been able to shadow Dawn. So, I mean, Dawn's built this up from scratch and she's done an amazing job. I think a lot of it is very much in Dawn's head. Uh, it's been a huge feat for her to put everything into a computer system and to make it accessible for other people to come and take over from that point. But it's been brilliant. There's a lot for me to access here. <laughs> it's pretty watertight. So it's been quite a good transition for me. So you're spending a lot of time at the computer at the moment. Now, we've talked to other departments, SET, for instance. You know, they will know where the shows are for this coming Christmas and they will be able to allocate sets. You can't do that in exactly the same way with costumes, of course. Obviously, you'll know which costumes you want for which show. But, of course, you don't know who's in the cast yet and sizes are really important. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it depends on the individual that you've got coming in, what the physical demands are, whether or not you need a, a larger costume, a smaller costume, everyone's different heights, different shapes. So there, there are challenges. We try to keep the sets together as best we can, but sometimes it will require us to make a costume. Sometimes we find that from stock we've got something that will still match that set so it just fits in quite nicely. So there are challenges that pose throughout the year but we try to get on top of it as best we can and to serve the show. So until the cast has been announced and, and you know who is going to be wearing which costume, what do you do? What's the first two or three months of the year all about for you? It's kind of that preparatory stage of saying what do we need to prep so there's lots of different things like up here in the room we've got our kit boxes which go out onto shows for our wardrobe mistresses we like to pack them full of cottons scissors uh, hair combs everything that they're going to need essentially to be able to make that a, an easier job for them so we get all of that ready we check over our sewing machines which go out we go through all of the sets of costumes and we say, right, this is the ideal for this, this is the ideal for this. However, we know in advance that this person's not going to suit this, so we then start to make arrangements. And, you know, we do that even from a budgetary point of view to say, is this something that we can afford to do or is this something that we need to have a look at a little bit later on down the line? Um, we have all other things that we do. There's lots of costumes that we can get dry cleaned in advance that we know are going to go out onto shows. So we try and get that done early on in the year. And it's always a case after all the shows come back, it gets a bit chaotic. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it, it gets a bit messy. So we have to tidy up our department, make sure that we're actually ready to go so that we can work effectively throughout the year. I guess as well, inevitably, there will be maintenance jobs. I mean, obviously, during the run of a show, things can get damaged, sometimes quite majorly, depends on what happens in a show. Wardrobe mistresses uh, and people looking after that department on the actual show can do some routine maintenance, but inevitably, when they come back in, that's the time to do any major overhaul, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So if we're looking at small rips in a seam that can just be done very quickly, that's normally done on site. But if we're looking at 
if it's in the middle of a fabric panel, mm. that's either a full remake or sometimes we can just replace the panel if we've got the fabric in stock already. So we have to assess everything and it's, it's big jobs like that that we like to make sure that we do. It makes the job easier for the wardrobe mistress in advance and because they have enough to do anyway. Yeah. Labelling costumes according to who's going in what and making sure that their tights are all separate so that they can keep them clean and respect everything from a hygiene point of view. So yes, we do do as much as we possibly can on site here. It can be a massive job. Mm -hmm. it, it just depends on, on what the costume is and what the show is. For example, one of our shows, we've got a snowy version of Jack and the Beanstalk and that's all velvet and taffeta. So you, you've got to be sensitive with how you replace bits on that. And sometimes if we find it is very heavily damaged, it's either a remake or repanel or whatever, really. Yeah. Now, I mean, we ought to say as well that a lot of people who come and see a panto might think, well, Cinderella was in this city last year. The whole show will transfer to another city this year. That's not the case. We've already talked about scripts not being identical and some of the sets might not be identical. They may not work in a smaller venue, for instance. Mm. The size of the stage and the props and so on might be different. However... Uh, with wardrobe, that's even more challenging because the script might change. There may be a slosh scene in one and not in another. So you don't need slosh costumes, which we can explain in a moment. But also, you've got other things to consider. We're not talking about just the uh, the tops, the bottoms, the dresses or whatever. We're talking about wigs. We're talking about uh, shoes, footwear as well. And all those can be different because sizes of people are different. But also, one dame, for instance, might like to wear Doc Martens. Another might like to wear platform heels or stilettos even so all that's got to be taken into consideration yeah and i think that's what's so exciting about the way that different actors work especially with our dames it's nice to have that element of variety mm. it keeps everything moving and we're con we're, in, we're in a changing world as well so the way that people want to approach things is slightly differently some dames for example like to have a slightly tighter waistline mm -hmm. some like to have a looser waistline some perhaps prefer the structured costumes and and others not so much so it, it's quite challenging but it's kind of thrilling as well yeah because it, it just means that every show in some way is going to be different rather than everything being a staple set of like yes we've got this but it's nice to work with the actor and individual and say this is what is planned for the set but is there anything we can do to kind of change it up for you this year or are you happy with this mm -hmm. and and that's that's all part of it yeah uh, some dames would actually like a waistline full stop but there you go <laughs> um okay let's, let's explain the slosh costumes because you know for anybody who doesn't uh, know panto you may have seen it we're talking about the slapstick scene which can be a baking scene or a boudoir scene uh, uh, but there's an awful lot of shaving foam if you like uh, custard pies and that sort of thing being uh, thrown around and so the costumes have to be sturdy to cope with all of that so slosh costumes are very different aren't they Yes, they are. And there's different types of slosh costumes. So some of them are washable costumes, which once they get dirty, they get put into washing machines, they're washed and dried straight away, and they can go back onto stage immediately. Others are made from PVC, which is easily wipeable. They tend to last a little bit longer. But at the end of the day, they do have their wear. So we, we have to be sensitive and say, right, it's kind of come to end of life now. So we've we've got to replace it. But they are they are very, very different. Um, they can get a lot of mess everywhere. So it's just a case of making sure that everything's clean, tidy and ready to go back onto the stage. So they do require a lot of maintenance, yeah, yeah. but it's always good to have that slosh scene in there. And in terms of the maintenance as well, you know, that's a big job, mopping them down, washing them down and making sure there's no residue from the shaving foam on there. Inevitably, there might be some that you can't get out. But if you don't, if you never do that, it obviously dries. And every time you walk on and off stage, it looks like a snowstorm because it's basically powdering up and falling off. So that's a full time job in itself, isn't it? 
Oh, it absolutely is. And there, there's one thing that you can never get away from. It's the smell of slosh. <laughs> it, it just seems to linger around. I mean, even after it's been cleaned down, it just tends to have that lasting smell. But we do make sure that we wash them all down. Um, and we're very sensitive to make sure we try and get into the seams of the costumes as well to make sure that is all clear because they need to have a long a long life and they need to run on show after show after show. In a moment, we'll go upstairs and have a look at some of the costumes here. I, I say some of them because there are tens of thousands of costumes in the warehouse here but now we're in the middle of the year you know we've got a six months countdown or less than six months countdown now to the next season how does the rest of the year pan out now because obviously you've got fittings and other things to do so we've got lots and lots of things to do so we've got lots of production meetings uh, with creatives so we're talking to them about what we are proposing for sets what they want to do with their choreography with their direction and how does that match up with that and is it achievable and also we we start to recognize where there are limitations with where they can be creative in some cases just based on what we have and then all the rest of that like you say dame's fittings which are, are, are key throughout the year uh, we like to make sure we get that done as early as possible because they are so heavily structured sometimes mm -hmm. it requires quite a lot of alteration and then everything else it's list 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 <laughs> you know making sure that you're ticking everything off we tend to have a process where we like to work through all the kids maintenance first so we get all of that done making sure that all of the fastenings are on and, and tight anything that needs replacing on it so we, we get ahead of that for this year then we head into photo shoots and we have a long week with that and then after that we're pretty much into prepping all of the principal's costumes. So it's a huge job. It's then a case of taking everything off. So we've done all of these and then they get put into bags and they're labelled according to the actor and then all their accessories are put with that. And then they go and live back in wardrobe until we're ready to put them in the trundles, ready to set them off for the season. And the photo shoot's an interesting one because there may be some actors that you haven't had a chance to do fittings with by the photo shoot. So you'll have had their measurements because all the actors send in their measurements in advance when they sign contracts and everything. But that'll be the first time you'll probably get a chance to see some of them in their costumes. And inevitably, you may have to do some alterations, minor alterations, even on photo shoot days. Yeah, so we're always prepared for that. What we like to do next to the measurement forms, because there can be mistakes made uh, and sometimes things are put into the wrong box and, you know, that, that's just life. So we try and take costumes where we know that we probably have to fit them to the individual. So sometimes they're, they're slightly larger, mm. but that means that we can pull everything in. Uh, we also take fabrics with us and a sewing machine, quick and picks, everything that we can so that we, we can very last minute just go right okay it's just unpick that seam and, and sew it back to a, a slightly larger size or sometimes smaller so we, we have contingencies for that and sometimes we take spare costumes because what suits one person doesn't necessarily suit the next and also you're meeting them for the first time and sometimes yeah. only just seeing them so you're actually like well it was a nice idea from that set but maybe this costume works better i mean you're very kind to actors but they are always rubbish at measuring themselves properly <laughs> and dare i say sometimes lying about the weight or size of the uh, of the person so yeah you're being very generous there but that's when it really starts to kick in and then as we get closer and closer to rehearsals and so on all the stuff has to be shipped out you know which is a big job in itself it's mm. it's like a dispatch area outside here isn't it it's just one of those things where it's like right let's get it into the box make sure that everything's in there we have a huge tick list per show and we go through absolutely everything tick 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 and if something is missing sometimes it's a case that it's just some underwear that we put with the the costume so it, it can be laundered very easily and not affect the top costume but we make sure that everything is is ticked off in the box in the trundle and then off it goes. I've just seen the list on the whiteboard. I remember many of these animal characters from Pantos. So you've got a list up there for the photo shoot of a couple of pandas, a brown bear, a purple gorilla. <laughs> Every Panto needs a purple gorilla. Absolutely. Obviously, Jack and the Beanstalk needs a cow or two. I think it's Aladdin with the camel, isn't it? Uh, Priscilla and Mother Goose. Yep. And Aladdin for, for the elephant, I think, as well. So... I mean, obviously the skin characters is on top of the regular cast. Yeah, and they do require quite a bit of maintenance and they are 
big costumes. <laughs> so sometimes trying to get them through a machine. For example, we, we've got a lovely horse, um, Harry the horse, and he's got four zips, one on each leg. And um, unfortunately, it's just it's just the nature of the costume. It wears and the zip goes. So we have to replace that. It is a challenge. Um, and sometimes it requires two people to try and get it through the machine. But uh, we, we get the job done. And, you know, they're charming and you, you don't want to not have them, really. So. I mean, it's lovely as well that traditions carry on in Imagine. I don't know if it's the same for other, other companies as well, but there is a, a sort of behind you ghost type character called Headless Eddie and it looks like you need a new one according to the list up there. Is that a rebuild from scratch? I'm not 100% sure with Headless Eddie but I know that he has been around for a long time so um, <laughs> bless him. He I, has. He's, he's probably going to need a little bit of maintenance at <laughs> least um, but uh, it would be interesting to see if he's um, come to his end of life or not. Okay, let's go and look at the costumes then upstairs, shall we? Sure. So we go back outside into the corridor. There are all sorts of meetings going on when I came in. Sarah and Steve Bowden in, uh, with the technical crews and out through the side door. And we came in here uh, a few weeks ago, uh, all the sets and props downstairs, and up we go. And this is where the main wardrobe department is, which is vast, I have to say. And that's why we need that incredible computer system that you've got downstairs. Everything, as we know, was barcoded during uh, COVID, which was fabulous, because it means pretty much, I'm not saying you know where every single thing is, but you pretty much have an idea of where things are, don't you? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're fairly organised. I mean, sometimes it looks like um, an organised mess, but we do tend to know where a majority of everything is. So we're currently on the, the Mesdek area, where a lot of our hats and our animal heads live and we sort them into boxes and then we code them to their show and their show code especially because in the wardrobe department we just can't fit everything in around the costume that it belongs to so uh, we we have everything here and as you can see it's um <laughs> it, it goes right up to the the top of the warehouse so um it's always at the top of the yeah, This is like an aircraft hangar. This place is absolutely vast and every tiny space has been used. And you're absolutely right. We're on the mezzanine floor, so upstairs effectively. And even this is literally stacked to the ceiling with boxes labelled by Panto with some mice in the transformation scene in Cinderella yeah. there. Yeah. Various other Aladdin wigs and props and so on baked wigs up there behind you one or two other things there's a dave the villager box we'll call him chorus for this one <laughs> um and, and so on so everything's properly labeled you can look on the computer downstairs and and find where it is and this is vast and then behind us is yes. a, an aladdin's cave if you pardon the pun of costumes this is <laughs> this is a fairy or fairy godmother uh, costume yeah this is the enchantress from uh, beauty and the beast ah a beautiful, beautiful dress. <laughs> so in here, you literally cannot see the walls or the ceiling for costumes, can you? No, I mean, we, we've got our standard rails, which are all fixed in place. There tends to be two sides to each aisle. And a, a lot of the time we're going up and down ladders to, to fetch items. But it's arranged by show or by item, by overflow item. So we have um, an aisle full of shirts, dresses, trousers, costumes from previous shows that we know we can probably pull on if we need to in future, if we haven't got everything mm -hmm. in the original sets. And then at the further down we go, we have different show sets. Like, so for example, the next one along, we've got uh, Peter Pan, we've got two sets of Snow White, we've got Puss in Boots, Dick Whittington, and there's, you know, varying numbers of, of those shows. And then after that, you've got Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, Beauty and the Beast. Uh, it's just endless. <laughs> so we've got a couple of Snow White dresses in front of us and the Peter Pan rail there. But above our heads, uh, a lot of dame costumes because you can't hang them up in the traditional way on a rail because they're so vast, aren't they? So they literally get suspended from the ceiling. Yeah, I mean, a lot of our structures are, are made from kite cane, which is very difficult to close down and, and pack together. So we kind of have to put it up in the air where it's going to have its own home and breathing space. Some of the costumes, the dame's costumes, can be flat packed and, and we can get them in, but a fair few of them do hang above our heads and we kind of just <laughs> have to know where they are. 
Yeah, this one is is a massive one. This is framed. I think this could be a walk down costume for a dame from. Um, oh, I don't know actually. Maybe maybe Sleeping Beauty. I, I honestly don't know. It could be an ugly, but I think I've seen that one before. I think I may have even worn that one before. <laughs> I mean, obviously they they're framed, and um, you know some of them that aren't framed have got crins underneath them as well. So they are pretty massive, aren't they? They're huge, and you know they take up a, a lot of space. And nine times out of ten, they require their own trundle just for the one character to send them off to the show just because of the sheer size of them. Mm. But they are fantastic. It's one of the elements that makes the show. It gives that element of surprise when the dame comes out onto the stage for the first time and you go, oh my gosh, like that's <laughs> so clever. Yeah. You know, some of the structures are just amazing. Um, so there, there's some real creation. So imagine this store... Um, think of the dame costumes you know for instance in, in a panto i'll probably wear maybe nine or ten different costumes you've got to have a full set of those for every panto that you stage and also you've got to have them in various sizes because obviously all actors are not the same as we said before mm -hmm. so that gives you a general idea of just how many dame costumes alone are in this store let's walk down here a little bit a little bit further and see what we've got down at the bottom end um i can see shoes and stuff at the bottom and again down this are a lot of cinderella and so on and beauty and the beast yes there are and um at the top uh, we've got crinolines which go under all of the the dame's outfits and the princesses and there's all varying shapes in those we've got pannier style styles which um fit from the side and we've got like the big Cinderella hooped dress and then we've got some slightly smaller ones for, for shorter skirts. Um, but that, I mean, there's all different shows of um, Cinderella down here from different years. So <laughs> some require a little bit more attention than others, but um, they seem to be lasting, which is good. We have talked about how much you like Panto. What's your favourite Panto? One of my favourites is probably Jack and the Beanstalk. I enjoy the moment when the giant comes out. I think that's um, <laughs> one of those moments that you anticipate for ages and then you see him and, and it's just fantastic. That's probably one of my favourites. But I mean, I've done Aladdin several times, so I think that has to be a close second. And the genie, a uh, fabulous role, which you said you'd played earlier, um, doubling up as the emperor. And that happens quite a lot in Panto as well, doesn't it? Yeah. So that adds another dimension to the costumes in a way because you're an actor, but you will need character costumes for two totally different characters yeah and and with the requirement of that role is that sometimes the two characters cross quite quickly between each other <laughs> as they cross over scenes yeah. so you then have to make sure that one costume is a quick change so it, it the way that fastens up against a normal costume is very very different and you have to be able to manage your time side stage with your dresser to make sure that you can get that on and off fairly quickly but it, it's great fun. The practicality we haven't really mentioned. We talked about the slosh costumes having to be practical, you know, to get covered in shaving foam and mm -hmm. so on. But also dames talk about costumes as, as a worker, as a worker costume, because you've got a lot of activity in a scene. So you don't want it with a crin and, you know, heavy and so on. You mentioned quick changes, you know, hook and eye buttons, whatever, are OK generally. But there may be, I don't know, sometimes a zip certainly velcro for quick change mm -hmm. and sometimes we use magnets that seems to be a, a popular development uh, just because they're fairly strong and they come off very easily and there tends to be limited damage to the costume and also the seams that they're attached to so everything has to be thought of in advance like how we're going to do this is it from the back is it easier to do it from the front where the actor does it themselves or is it a wardrobe mistress's job where you come off stage and that comes down that comes off and you know it, Everything has to be thought about in advance. There is a crossover as well, finally, between the departments in lots of different areas. Um, you know, sometimes it's difficult to know what is a prop and what is a costume, for instance. Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, some of the costumes may have electrics in because, and I'm not talking about mains electrics, but, you know, uh, battery operated electrics for lights and stuff like that, which presumably, if there is an issue with, you'll pass that over to one of the tech guys. Yes, that very much is a Passover. That's kind of a bit beyond me. I mean, we've got some costumes. There's, there's a lovely set of costumes that belong to an Aladdin set where the cast are in the same print as the cave. And so they kind of hide within the set. And then all of a sudden they've got little switches inside and they light up and yeah. they've got jewels glistening from their backs and from their sides. And, and it, it they look fabulous. But, you know, sometimes things happen on stage they do break so we then hand that over to a specialist team we have a, a wonderful lady 
Karen Horton, who seems to know exactly what to do. So we call on her quite a lot to come and fix bits and bobs. So it, it, it's a big job keeping all that maintained. It's a massive job. You've got a lot of work to do between now and uh, when rehearsals begin in November. So thank you for spending some time with us. And always rest assured, if there's a problem and you're struggling, you can always phone the Oracle. Absolutely. Yeah, that was one thing I was like, I know you're going on maternity, but you are still accessible, right? And she's like, absolutely. Call me anytime. So I've got to thank her really. And um, I'm just honoured to take over the job that she does so well. Excited as well. Aaron, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you so much. Well, that's about it for now then. Don't forget to subscribe to the series to catch up with any episodes you've missed and make sure you don't miss any future episodes. Make sure you join me as well next time when I'll be chatting to Head of Casting and Production, Louise Redmond. I'll see you then. Thank you for listening to the latest edition of Just Imagine, the podcast series from Imagine Theatre. And you can find out more by going to www.imagintheatre.co.uk.